Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> Look at that. It's a die wow. dog. Right here. <laughs> That's awesome. Wait, actually, Maker has a mascot dog. What was the name of it? Wasn't what it a was capybara? It? it was a capybara. The yeah, capybara capybara. won the mascot. Yeah, it kind of looks like a dog. It's like a big. But there's a dog token too. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Oh, breaker, 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 yeah. breaker, 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 maker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thousand to one, right? You can mint, break, you can mint and burn an MKR for breaker and back. And forth, oh shit! Right? So if you felt yeah, yeah. poor, you could do that. I think that was Mariano's hackathon project just for fun. It still exists. Yeah, it's on dice The unit bias one, right? Yeah, yeah the unit bias dog. <laughs> <laughs> Only on Maker Dow. Sick tunes. That's right, yeah. Only on Maker Dow delegates. <laughs> folks it's another episode of drinks with maker doubt delegates in 2023 two tray two tray let's go let's go let's go get excited on drinks with maker doubt delegates it's a brand new episode super excited to be here this thursday morning thursday afternoon Good afternoon to you out there, Raf. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Busy day. I actually I had a, a wonderful um, AM. I met um, a community member of Maker who lives in Munich. So that, that was pretty cool. Super awesome. Super awesome. And, and today uh, we have a Maker Dow Delhi that's been featured here before. And I believe he hosted, he helped host the show as well. So very uh, grateful for Tim Black. Tim Black for stepping in. Tim, what's going on, brother? What's up, everybody? Up early for the community yet again. Happy to be here. Dialing into the West Coast. A true Maker Doc community trooper right there, Tim Black. And on today's show, we have a special guest. I would say he's probably the most brilliant, uh, sarcastic individual when it comes to telling you the truth but kind of like put it in a way that is just, uh, I mean, it's just unbelievably smart. Uh, I love the things he says uh, on the Maker Dow Discord, the forum, uh, none other than Adrian from Strategic Finance. How are you, Adrian? Hi, uh, yeah, hello everyone. That's a very generous introduction, too generous. Oh, it's so true, it's so true. I mean, you you have a uh, way with words, man, and, and I really appreciate how you, uh, yeah, you, you, defend the community and you also, uh, you know, give good reasoning for the way uh, perhaps things should be, right? From your point of view, at least, and many others who will probably agree with some of the theories of how our DAO should be, should be run and governed and, and built and scaled. So really appreciate everything that you do for the community. Happy to have you. Um, I do have one big question though. Are you joining us live from Davos, Switzerland? <laughs> no, no, I, I needed to get away from the, from the bug eating festival as far away as I could. So I'm actually in Madrid this week uh, for personal reasons. I'm getting married this summer in Madrid, my hometown. Uh, oh, so, whoa. So I'm wearing a shirt with those wearing on suits. So, yeah. Oh, you look from, good, uh, man. <laughs> from one married man to another. Good luck, friend. <laughs> <laughs> Two, <Appreciate it. laughs> three, you got it. You got Best it. decision. Best decision. Yeah, it is. Always remember one thing, Adrian. It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, and you'll be fine. <laughs> 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 I'm sure you heard that one before, but um, yeah, man. I actually thought you were dressed up just for the show, so so thanks for clearing that up. But I was going to say, man, that's so, I feel so underdressed, but. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, this is Drinks with Maker Dow Delegate, so we usually kick it off with uh, a drink or two. Um, yeah, it's pretty early in the morning for us here uh, in the U.S. and for folks uh, out there in Europe. Uh, you might have a surprise for us today. We'll see. But uh, why don't we kick it off? Adrian, what do you got? So since I'm in Madrid, I have a glass of gazpacho, which is a uh, oh. cold tomato soup 
that I really like, and I literally drink it in by the glass. That's amazing! Wow, that is that's super cool, super cool. I was actually watching uh, the famous uh, chef from Barcelona, and he actually went to I believe is is Gaspacho from Andalusia. Correct me exactly. If I'm wrong. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and he was showcasing. Uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a great trip. I'll link it. Andres is his name. Uh, great chef from Spain uh, that I believe lives in the U.S. now. But uh, his daughters were born in the U.S., so he's kind of riding around Spain, teaching them the culture and how he grew up. And Gaspacho was actually Andres? one. Wait, Jose, Jose Andres. Andres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Doesn't he have a cool. book on just vegetables or whatever? He's amazing. That guy's an incredible chef. He is. He is. Shout out to Jose Andres. Maybe we could have him on the show here and uh, Adrian can help us out, you know. Uh, <laughs> how to use a wallet. It'd be tight. I think he'd be into it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's traveling around the world. Might as well know, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Baby steps. Totally. What, what's in the gazpacho, Adrian? Can you kind of describe it? Uh, my favorite is, so I actually have salmorejo, which is a slightly different version, which is tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, onions, garlic, water, olive oil, and salmorejo has a bit of uh, stale bread. This is my my favorite version. Yeah. Holy cow, you're making me hungry, man. It sounds <laughs> delicious, I'm so jealous. It's really good, yeah. yeah. I bet, I bet. Uh, Raf, what, what do you got for us? Anything German? Hey, um, I need to get it from the fridge. Uh, <laughs> take team first and I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, dang. <laughs> The Europeans are outclassing us, Frank. We got to start drinking in the morning, I guess. I'm boring again. I only have water. I, I can already say that we can skip the rating and say this is more of a 3.5 water scale. Doesn't really, doesn't really count up to Tahoe from last week, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, but it is in my like slowly accumulating swag bottle with some of the, the world's only compound swag, as far as I know, more rare than Unisox. So this is bay water tap water. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would presume and I and I hope Marin it's tap water, baby. Marin tap water. <laughs> Marine tap water. I don't know. Okay. You never know yeah. what Marin. Marin's a little sometimes that, that hippie roots comes out a little bit sometimes for the like, you know, raw water people or some stuff like that. Not me, but every once in a while the freak flag flies and people want to do what they gotta do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So so far we're getting Tim watered down black uh, on the show, man. We gotta get the real Tim back. Come on, man. 100% pure. Start hosting right. at like five in the afternoon, man. That's seven in the morning. <laughs> so I, I got a, an American uh, uh, watermelon flavor black tea. I'm not sure if you can see it because it's, uh, you know. Uh, so it's mint uh, black tea. So it's watermelon. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, this can wake me up and we can have an exciting show. But what about you, uh, Raf? What did you get when you ran back there to get something quickly? It's a beer. It's a beer. Bring back the Practice. alcohol. Bring back the alcohol. It's called Noctus 100 Black Secret. And it has 10% of alcohol. Oh, Oof. my. <laughs> Very nice. Starting it off today. It's right. Damn. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers to that gazpacho. Uh, I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, coming here, uh, cheers, Adrian. Cheers. Much success to um, to Maker Dow and the core teams. Real quickly, we have a lot to cover. Let's uh, rate our drinks. Start off with uh, you, Adrian. What uh, what do you give that gazpacho? It's got to be a five star. Yeah, yeah, it's a ten out of five. It's really good. Gazpacho is the best. Awesome, awesome. I uh, can only imagine. I, I guess I got to try it when I get back over there. What about you, uh, Raf? Uh, I'll give star. this five stars. This is amazing. It has like a licorice chocolate taste, super velvety, like an amazing beer, really. This tea here, uh, I don't taste the mint on it, so I don't know if I brewed it incorrectly. Maybe I rushed it, so I'm going to give it a three. Yeah. Bop, bop, bop. Thank you again, uh, Adrian, for being here with us. Uh, this is definitely going on in your realm, uh, specifically with real world assets, or as we call them, RWAs. Recently, we had a lot of uh, different proposals that came to uh, the maker uh, MKR token owners who needed to decide if they wanted to onboard some of these RWA uh, proposals. 
And one of them was MIP-65. Um, can you kind of walk us through what exactly is MIP-65 and what were some of the um, obstacles or hurdles that you might have faced as uh, a team member of strategic finance and how did your team kind of work through it to, to get MIP-65 to where it is today, which is actually live. Yeah, I think MIP-65 is is the, um, so for the lay people who, for whatever reason, are watching this on YouTube, MIP-65 is the name of the proposal that approved a vault uh, that, sent, that functionally invested 500 million DAI in US treasuries. And conceptually, it's also one of the more sort of eyebrow raising and head turning proposals out there at the moment because it's kind of strange that this DeFi proposal is, is is functionally lending money to the US government. The structure of this is also very intricate and very complicated because of the nature of getting crypto collateral off chain. Uh, so there is a lot of sort of involved plumbing in the back end, uh, which, which makes it also a, a, a noteworthy deal in that respect. In summary, it basically takes the USDC in the PSM and shifts it in terms of allocation into off-chain investments in US treasury bonds. And there's a whole load of sort of legal innovations that are necessary in order to do this in a safe way because the big disadvantage of going off-chain, although, so let's start with the disadvantages. I would say the big disadvantage is obviously that it's off-chain. MakerDAO is a system that needs to have as much liquidity as possible available so that DAI holders can redeem their tokens for the underlying collateral. And having anything that's sort of off-chain introduces a level of fric both friction and trust assumptions that are necessary in order for the whole system to function, which is maybe a slight step away from what the original vision for Maker was or, 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 or maybe not where all of the collateral on the on the system in MCD would have been liquidable on chain. However, I do see it as a sort of important first step to get to a place where makers balance sheet is structurally more sound and invested more, more intelligently. To the extent that DAI has a dollar peg, it should be managed or token holders should aim to manage it in, a, in an intelligent way. And so in this respect, I think MIP65 accomplishes those goals. Uh, very well, and it does so. And it does so. So within the constraints of the legal system, so within the, you know, what what sort of crypto, what some what some members of the crypto community might see as as uh, inappropriate concessions towards the existing legal system. That being said, the legal setup is among the safest and is no different to having you know any client of a brokerage or a bank invest their money into us treasuries so there the biggest risk is the you know governments would have to go out of their way to sanction and seize mip 65 assets if they wanted to punish make it up so yeah i would to, to try and keep it simple for the audience i would say that it's essentially about setting up foundations that take instructions from maker token holders, which is in itself a, an interesting legal innovation. And this is an important step because it gives the customer of the banks and brokerages a legal personhood, which has rights and can defend those rights. And furthermore, this crosses various jurisdictions. So, you know, to an extent, there's a limitation of of possible jurisdictional specific risk by doing so. And the final endpoint is, is a bank in, in Switzerland, as it turns out, um, uh, which is also a sort of friendly place for crypto. It's one of the uh, regulatory environments that probably recognizes the benefits of crypto technology for, for its own sake and doesn't aim to politicize the regulation too much. So, so yeah, happy happy to go into e any one of these <laughs> many little and and if there's anything I don't know. So I wasn't personally involved with much of the setup. It was all sort of in progress by the time that I had started contributing in a more full time way. So I'm only sharing to the extent that I I'm aware. 
but my colleagues are are very knowledgeable about very knowledgeable about, well, knowledgeable about this. And you should also have Alan Peterson from Monetaris on board because he knows the whole system inside out. Just just maybe a, <clears throat> a top level overview. How can Maker really be sure that the instructions are carried out? Because like Maker has ultimately no recourse on this on this uh, legal counterparty, right? No, that's true in the sense that a token holder individually probably doesn't have much recourse. However, the foundation setup is no different to many other orphan foundation setups where the directors take instructions based on a set of rules. And were they not to accomplish these or execute them faithfully, they would be breaching their fiduciary duty to the to the to the assets that they supervise or to the legal setup that they work under. And to that extent, I think there's probably things that token holders could band together to do to pursue if the directors tried to rug. I mean, we're talking about possible scenarios, sure, but they would be quite extreme in terms of the, let's say, level of criminality that it would require. So I want to, uh, there's something you said there uh, with regards to MIP65 and its jurisdiction, which is uh, Switzerland. And I've seen you post uh, a lot of commentary on the public forum uh, and Discord uh, with regards to Switzerland and how it has some advantages. Kind of give us your take about Switzerland and why Switzerland, as an American, I feel kind like my country right now is falling behind when it comes to keeping up with this amazing ecosystem. So kind of give us the idea to walk through why Switzerland has an advantage and why it has, why it has made that, that leap forward as opposed to what's happening here in the US. Yeah, I think, um so i'm a big fan of the the as in itself switzerland is a very friendly country in to a decentralized ethos from a political standpoint it's set up in a very decentralized and federalized way so the swiss federal government is one actor with very remarkably limited power in relation to the underlying subunits the cantons which hold most of the power and do most of the things. So each of the cantons have, they're like mini countries and they have, they compete in various respects. They set their own taxes, they make their own rules. And the federal government is basically sort of preoccupied with a very narrow set of things. And among these things is, for, in, for instance, the regulation of money and money issuance. However, I also think that from a sort of constitutional standpoint, from like a personality standpoint, if a country could have a personality, they have this mindset of Switzerland is a very small country that has very few natural resources and is essentially indefensible, although they could put up a mean fight given the ability of the, the country to conscript civilians into doing military service and how armed everyone is. Um, so they need to rely on other sorts of intellectual resources to get ahead and to stay ahead. And in this respect, I think they've for a long time recognized the value of attracting, you know, talent from different technologies and from innovative sectors, whether it's biotechnology or crypto. And as a result, you have sort of legal setups that are, I think the best thing that you can say for them is that they're more or less agnostic as to the underlying technology. So the Ethereum Foundation, for example, which is set up in Switzerland, is a foundation and the government doesn't really care what the point is, as long as it's sort of legally run and administered, which it is. You know, the fact that the Ethereum Foundation could be host to a technology that could in sort of one day compete with the Swiss National Bank is, is so far beyond their, like, it's not of interest. And... I think that's probably the ideal way to regulate crypto. They do introduce rules for areas of crypto which start to intersect meaningfully with, you know, existing uh, existing laws, namely in financial services. So, this would be the the example of the Digital Ledger Act, I think it's called, which is an amendment to the Code of Obligations, which is sort of like a backbone book of laws that is sort of the basis for all contracts in Switzerland. And it recognizes in certain 
narrow and defined aspects where you can use digital ledger technology and where you can't and in what ways you can use it that's sort of allowed and the interesting innovation here is that they recognize that the technology can basically keep is functionally a spreadsheet of sorts and so they allow the equivalence of using a spreadsheet whether it's on a digital ledger or on a or on a database or on a hard drive or on a piece of paper they make that one-to-one -one equivalence and say like okay, if you record a change of ownership, as long as you follow security's rules, you can basically record it in, in whatever compliant way you can find, including the digital ledger. And I think this is a great boon for the space. And it's probably why you have sort of two Signum and Seba Bank. You have two sort of hybrid traditional finance slash crypto banks. Uh, that are based in Switzerland. It's like in the US where we basically have two hybrid banks, right? Silvergate and the other S name that I never remember. Yeah. Uh, signature. Thank you. That's the one. I would say, so without really, I, I don't know what the, you know, books are for Signum in detail, but I would, in, I would expect them to be more conservatively run than American banks, just given the culture of banking. Um, the other aspect of, of course, is the cultural aspect. So Switzerland is famous for this concept of numbered accounts, which is no longer a thing or is a thing, but not in the way that's, <laughs> that's sort of helpful to evade taxes anymore. Uh, because they have this concept of sort of keeping to yourself and keeping a very private sort, sort of hold on your personal financial matters. And you used to be able to open a bank account and just stay a name or no name and open it under a number. And in practice, a lot of people from different countries started using these as rat holes to evade taxes, which is, you know, probably not great, but it speaks to the sort of culture that the financial services industry grew up under. Uh, then, of course, the European Union and Barack Obama, you know, squished on that. So that doesn't happen anymore. But it's still, it's still a culture that, you know, even after the coronavirus lockdowns and all of this, they, you know, people still like to use cash. Uh, they have the largest or second largest denomination of bills in the world. I think the largest is Singapore. Uh, but you can essentially have a 1,000 franc bill in paper and use it. And yeah, I mean, it's Switzerland, so you can actually get change from it also. If you use it in a shop, nobody really, nobody really blinks. Yeah, I can, I can go and buy a, a bar of chocolate and pay with 1,000 franc bills. Yes, it would. Oh, I mean, wow. it would. It's crazy. It would be fully legal and chances are you would probably get changed. Yeah. Super cool. Um, let's switch gears here and get into MIP81, which is the Coinbase custodial proposal, which essentially takes uh, USDC out of the PSM. And as we know, a lot of folks in this ecosystem know that Maker uh, has a, a large amount of USDC backing <laughs> our infamous uh, DAI stablecoin. I should say famous stablecoin. Um, so MIP81 has been proposed. It was a proposal created by the Coinbase uh, custodial folks. When it comes to getting that rolled out MIP81, there's obviously been a lot of hurdles, including setting up uh, a legal entity that can represent, as you said, this amazing new organizational structure known as DAOs. Um, what were some of the things that uh, perhaps keep you up at night when it comes to MIP81? Or do you see this as a viable solution to not only put money to work, right? Uh, maybe you can explain also how MIP81 works uh, for the folks watching this. But also, um, is, there, is there a tremendous upside for the MakerDAO community when it comes to implementing MIP81 and get it off the ground? So, sorry to ramble again. I, just to take a, a brief step back, because I think this is relevant. I, to the extent that, that I had a soft peg that wasn't secured by a, a sort of cushion of protocol on USDC, the peg of die to the dollar didn't really, quote unquote, matter. And it depended entirely on decentralized collateral. And in this period, it's in this period, of course, that Black Thursday occurred and Maker became insolvent due to the bug in the liquidations. But I think it probably could have continued thereafter i think the introduction of the basically what i'm getting at is the introduction of the psm as a feature of the protocol marks a sea change in how die 
is managed because it's no longer a pure lending engine. It's a mediator of demand for stable coins. And once you make that choice of pegging it to the functionally the dollar, given that USDC is basically a tokenized dollar, then you know the logical endpoint of all of this is essentially a, a MakerDAO system that is properly allocated to an appropriate sort of list of dollar denominated dollar denominated assets. Ideally, all of these assets would essentially be on chain and liquidable in the same way that decentralized collateral is. I think that should be the end goal. We should strive and aim to work towards a system where we can have permissionless, you know, no blacklist uh, tokens that represent U.S. Treasury claims that are valid in both the legal world and in the crypto world, and that can be liquidated on chain with enough liquidity. I think this is the sort of end, and this is the logical endpoint. After, if major token holders want to peg DAI to anything else, then the strategy changes completely, and you know, you you figure out what that asset backing looks like to the extent that they seek a, do a dollar peg. This is, in my view, how it should probably be run. The Coinbase proposal is a step, is a frankly intermediate step in that direction because it's obviously not, it's it's none of those things. It's not fully on chain. It's not unblacklistable. It's not permissionless. It's not, you know, a whole plethora of things. It's not even the full treasury yield in the backing. Mm -hmm. That said, it's, it's subjectively better than zero. And the structure of, so to give people context, MIP81 is a proposal by the Coinbase um, custody team, which some people might take might think is strange because Maker as a custodian is better than Coinbase as a custodian, frankly. But what they do allow is through whatever legal magic they're able to conjure with their circle partnership to functionally share some of the yield that they are earning on the treasuries with MakerDAO. They, they call it something else and it's not tied to the yield. Um, the way that this would be earned uh, in their thinking is in custody. And the way that Maker has found a solution to avoid having those dollars move off chain or be locked in a sort of Coinbase cold wallet or something is a smart contract on which Coinbase has a veto. And I think they need this veto to claim that they are a custodian or something. And so obviously the, the potential upside and the rewards for die, ho for die holders and make it holders is potentially quite large, given the size of the allocation that's, that's envisaged and given the rate. It's not quite as high as a rate as you, we could probably earn getting exposure to US treasuries directly. However, it is a step more liquid because, you know, nonetheless, and all things considered, it's still on chain and we could still withdraw it uh, through a governance vote directly without having to go through a whole rigmarole of, you know, moving back and forth different bank, bank accounts. So- Sorry to just jump in here <clears throat> with, the, with the withdrawal, I mean, then our delay, I think, I think you're you're absolutely right. The, the way I understood it is it's a legal requirement so that they can claim that, that they are in fact a custodian. Mm. But I think like we, we're talking about up to 1.6 billion of USDC here. So that's yeah. at the moment like more than two-thirds of the available USDC. Um is a 10 hour window not exposing us to to a massive risk in, in the case of a very large liquidation it is <laughs> yeah it's possible it's no look it's certainly possible um i think there's always a with any of these investments as you move away from liquidity so there's a few there's a few mitigating factors firstly DAI does seem to be stickier than many people might expect although the effective possible let's say duration of DAI is zero because you could burn it in one transaction and redeem the underlying collateral. In practice, people are holding DAI for a very long time. I don't have these specific numbers, but my colleague Seb has done this maturity analysis of DAI on chain. And even through the worst of market turbulence, the maturity of DAI has held quite well and quite constantly over time. But to stay sort of on the 10 hour time lock, does the 10 hour time lock 
create a greater risk of not being able to redeem die an illiquidity crunch basically where we would not be able to redeem enough die should it be liquidated for whatever reason no i mean objectively yes right because if there are sort of four billion dollars worth of liquidations in the space of nine hours then we'd be stuck with all the usdc and coinbase and i don't know what that would that, what that would look like it wouldn't look very nice um and these are factors that you know delegates have to take into consideration when making their choices and you know is the time lock the the last word on how you could set this up maybe maybe not i think there are, are a number of constraints that coinbase faces in order to propose this in terms of being able to call themselves a custodian and so forth my personal view is that circles should stop rent seeking from usdc holders and just distribute the yield for the treasuries that they are invested in but they like they do that already for retail like if you just go on coinbase anyway they if you hold yeah. coinbase in their account and some one of their they change the ui it's not it's complicated but yeah i mean they do distribute it right but the that's true yes it's the, the same yield on I... bills like three months is like 4.5 percent or something so like coming yeah. in for 1.6 is hard i think it that's more of like a not meant to be an attack just an aside it's like these yields change quite quickly, right? Like, I mean, everybody's watching the world's favorite influencer, J-Pow. So like, we're kind of all paying attention to it. And the MIPS process doesn't really like sync up with capturing the best yield. So there has to be some sort mm -hmm. of like more flexible way to like think through this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, optimistic to see where that goes, but anyhow. anyhow. So, yeah. no, yeah. So, so yeah, I think you'd have to weigh the probability of, I mean, you know, is there a likelihood that Coinbase could arbitrarily veto a withdrawal? I think that we could probably set up the agreement so that they don't have that ability, so that they are only able to do it in the case of a, like a government sanction or something. You know, in which case the use of USDC by MakerDAO is suspect anyway. It's not a, you know, it's it's not a mitigating it's not a mitigating factor because it's still an enormous an enormous amount of risk but it's the sort of risk that unfortunately a decentralized protocol that is pegged so closely to the dollar probably has to follow given its objective of earning an adequate return on its assets just to simplify everything you just walked us through right now it sounds to me like you're saying there could be an agreement with uh, the folks at Coinbase where there is some kind of uh, stipulation if they do have to, for some reason uh, or another, hold on to that USDC, perhaps a bounty, for lack of a better word, would be paid to make or DAO uh, because it was exercised. Am, am I understanding that correctly, that there's some kind of, I don't want to call it a penalty, but there's some kind of tranche where if that is frozen, uh, MakerDAO would get uh, a payout. But is that what you're saying there? Or uh, No, but I, I I, swear someone mentioned this on the thread or the possibility of having some kind of a penalty in case the withdrawal was locked inappropriately or something. This this may be the case, but I, I haven't kept in sync with the thread in a while, so I'm not sure. I, I don't think I was going along that path. I, I was just referring to the the constraint. So I think Coinbase probably faced the constraint of having some some form of a veto, whatever that looks like. And the risk that Maker faces is that this veto is exercised, of course. But the they the way that it seems that they are framing it is that they could stipulate that this veto only be exercised in the case of. But you raise an uh, yeah. I mean, you raise a fair point that you know if they if they represent that this is the case then arguably you could have damages in place but like this all sort of illustrates the reasons why this is less it's it's better than zero but it's less good than you know fully on chain because this sort of legal minutiae DAOs are not well equipped to handle it's very annoying as a customer as a regular customer or as a legal entity or with some sort of personhood it would be easy. It would be uh, the sort of typical clause that you might ask for. But for a DAO, it's more complicated. So yeah, I think in that said, I tend to the view that 
engaging with, I think MakerDAO has enough size and relevance that it can afford to engage with partners who are more centralized and push them in the right direction rather than disengage and break links completely. Because realistically, the only way to fully break links with the existing legal system is to not be pegged to the dollar at all. And a halfway house where it sort of is pegged to the dollar, but it's kind of like not, and it doesn't really engage with the real world is not really, it doesn't seem all that realistic or productive towards improving the ecosystem around us. I mean, Coinbase is a player, like it or not, a very large one. Maker is a minnow in, in this space if you take into account you know, fully centralized exchange. So to the extent that we are able to get Coinbase to a place where we are more comfortable with it, even if that takes several steps, I think we should be satisfied also. And the same applies to Gemini. Uh, how you are deciding whether um, collateral is worthwhile in the beginning and then how you monitor that risk going forward with existing collaterals? I th so, we are onboarding now the risk monitoring function to, of the former real world finance core unit, which means that we're taking over responsibility and we have Rue in the community now, Sam, who's a you know, really smart, very well accomplished guy who's who sort of believes in the project and he's really keen to help. And similarly also more experienced, way more experienced than I am in you know, credit and risk and financial services and all this. And there's two sort of main types of real world asset vaults that we've opened in total up until this point. One is a very sort of high touch engaged one, which are some of the earlier ones where we pioneer the sort of real world asset foundation, the, you know, the legal setup and all this to do more of a direct investment style. Set up. Then you have sort of more, let's say, arm's length approaches. Usually the ones that involve centrifuge are an example of this, where they have an intermediary or as Maker would call it, an arranger that basically takes on a lot of the responsibility for sourcing the, the right types of assets and then faces the an, an, a sort of appropriate risk reward. And in terms of monitoring, and I think we need to be very careful on the duration of these assets and on the default rate and on the loss given default and on the way that these liquidations and seizures are, are processed. To my knowledge, I don't think we've been exposed to, a, to, to this yet. And we, it's just something that we need to monitor, but it's something that we need to, I'd rather, I'd rather stop wading into it because it's also not an area that I'm, that I'm very focused on. I'm really, more of the bookish accounting accounting type. Like the accounting, I think is also really interesting. <clears throat> so for instance, like we're giving out some loans, for example, or like not we're giving out loans, but we are facilitating other people that are then giving out loans, I think is, is the correct way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. And then like from an accounting perspective, you would have to kind of factor in the health of these loans, right? So you know yes. what, and and you are able to, to effectively do that. These are the counterparties helpful in providing the, the necessary data there? Or? So the counterparties are definitely very helpful in providing the necessary the, the, the data for the underlying loans. We have not yet started basically marking to market or marking to value the individual RWA vaults, which would be the next step to do this. And this is something where from an accounting standpoint, we've recognized, let's say in the real world asset vaults that do have repayments, we are recognizing that benefit, but we are not recognizing any potential decreases in value as a result of defaults or as a result of late payments or what have you, or just change in market conditions or anything like this. And then for vaults that are sort of fully off chain, like MIP 65, we have neither, let's say, because all of the interest and the yield is generated off chain. So we are unable to see it. We can, Count it under <laughs> under our breath, but but it's not reflected on chain. And similarly, the value of the principal changing is similarly not reflected on chain. So that would be an important step to take to, you know, look for pricing agents that could help us evaluate the value of these real world asset vaults, and you know maybe set a 
schedule for doing so. That's sort of reasonable given the characteristics of the drones. What's kind of needed there? Like what, what kind of color bodies are we looking for? Is this like um like Price Waterhouse Coopers and Standard and Poor's of the world or, or what? Yeah, for example. Yep. Yeah. And then then yeah. And then depending on the I think the asset type, there might be more specialized uh, pricing agents that could be more helpful. But I think Rue would be a better place to answer this. Yeah, shout out to Rue, the uh, superb individual. So excited to have him uh, as part of the MakerDAO community. I uh, had a chance to meet him uh, recently. And he, uh, yeah, cr quite an impressive individual. So yeah, looking forward to seeing a lot of things for, from Rue. Um, one thing that Standard & Poor's might not comprehend so easily, and a lot of folks, uh, even in the community, still don't comprehend very easily, is the end game. Uh, the end game constitution is here. We're in the pregame. What are your personal thoughts? Of course, you're part of a core unit, but every core unit is independent. There is no hierarchy here. Uh, but you personally, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the end game? So, I mean, to be totally honest, I still struggle to understand it in, in depth. I'm much more interested in like the numbers. Uh, like all of the organizational stuff is a little bit beyond me. And to the extent that there is a simplification in the core of the protocol, I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, because, I mean, if you think about, so abstracting away the whole value of you know if you take a step back and think about what is the value of having a crypto protocol intermediate between two counterparties as might be in the case of you know someone who's holding a maker collateral and someone who's holding die the whole point is that there's nobody involved so i think in the long run all crypto protocols either you are i, I have this sort of mental framework where you are either a company that somehow has a crypto thing attached to it, where it's helpful to remove some sort of a middleman interaction that was costly to the margin, and then it therefore helps you be more efficient. Or you are a crypto protocol, a pure crypto protocol. And even though you might have many of the characteristics of a company, like, you know, people might be able to sketch out a balance sheet and an income statement for you. In practice, your long run destination should be to operate with ideally no people at all, because isn't that the whole point? that we are able to set up peer-to-peer -peer interactions with no middleman. So to the extent that the end game is a step in this direction, I think it's probably a good thing. And we've seen already how, you know, having all of this vault complexity tied into the core of the protocol lends itself to escalating organization size. And, you know, you need to find the right experts for things and that takes time and maybe they're not the right experts and you have to find new people Then these people you have to sort of depend on them and this creates sort of linkages and dependencies that are not great to move towards that sort of ideal end state and then regarding the the sort of unpegging or the stage where maker that would lose its fragility you know, to, to being seized or something like that i think that's one of I see it as sort of one of the experiments in free banking that crypto has enabled, which is interesting. It's certainly not the only one, and I don't expect it to be the last one either. Like Rai, for example, is a very intriguing concept where they've essentially abstracted away the idea of a Fed, and they put that calculation of what the rate should be into an algorithm, and they let that set it. Um, I would be excited to see what Rai might look like if it were pegged to real, let's say tokenized crypto real world collateral. I think that could be really transformative. Rai is probably also an exercise in purity, right? Like it's it's very focused on on decentralization purity. Something like Rai, right? Is there a real world usage for something like that? Do you think that a nation state needs to adopt one of these uh, cryptocurrencies? such as DAI or RAI, or maybe even FRAX, that's the national reserve of the uh, said country. So I actually don't know that, I don't think it would be desirable for any, con for any country to specifically mention DAI as a transaction or reserve or tender or anything like this. So I think initiatives like, you know, the, the Bitcoinization of El Salvador and all this stuff is, is like a lot of publicity, but it's not really 
I don't think it's really the point. We have models of economies that have experienced dollarization. We have many such examples in the real world and in history. And you don't really need to in, enact a law that says that such and such currency is the legal tender because people will just choose to use whatever legal tender is best suited for their purpose. If you look at a country like Lebanon, which is maybe the extreme case of a hyper corrupt dysfunctional government with no monetary sovereignty, they don't need to enact the dollar as the transaction currency. People simply use the dollar, whether the government likes it or not. And think, thankfully, because otherwise they would be stuck with the sort of worthless, you know, paper that that the, their central bank issues. So I think the long run desirable endpoint is probably something that looks a bit more like a free banking system where the government has to compete for the right to, you know, uh, for the right to exercise seniorage over, over its citizens and for the right to issue money that's recognized as a transaction currency. I don't think the ECB has a natural Let's say it has a legal right to be the sole issuer of currency in the eurozone, but I don't think it necessarily has the natural or moral right. And what's missing in here is the ability for people to choose a different transaction type. And I think framing it like this also puts pressure on the builders of cryptocurrencies to build a product that people need and want to use. Because we get lost a lot in the weeds of you know, governance and, you know, the rules and the SEC and all this stuff. But I think it's, it's good if we sort of try to think back to why exactly are we doing this? And who does, who can it benefit the most? And I think DAI has massive potential in this, in this regard. And so I think an end state where DAI grows in utility is one where, you know, people start using that just because it's better than whatever government shitcoin they have as an alternative. And I can't, I couldn't think of better words to end this episode. I think that you just said some magical things there, uh, analyzing how perhaps one day we can get away from dollarization, uh, or perhaps not. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on this show, man. Really appreciate having you, Adrian. I think you're a gem for the community as well Appreciate as your that. team. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Nice talking. Good stuff, Adrian. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs>